So uh, thanks for the introduction, and thank you, Roman, this morning for the short introduction to Hashgraph. There are a couple of slides you might recognize. Um, so uh, yes, I'm Greg Scalard. I'm based in France. I'm a lead developer for uh, Europe, uh, or lead developer advocate for Europe. There are two of us uh, in Europe, two in Singapore and two in California. Um, and we typically connect with our developer community. That's the community of developers who are interested in developing on Hashgraph. Uh, or Hedera Hashgraph, I should say, um, which is the public deployment of the Hashgraph protocol or the Hashgraph algorithm, uh, consensus algorithm. Uh, so you can find me uh, on these different channels uh, should you want to. So I'll cover the characteristics of uh, our consensus protocol really r rapidly because uh, I want to get into gossip about gossip and virtual voting. I figured this would be interesting to you as an audience. It's sometimes difficult to figure out uh, what an audience expects. Uh, so I'll go into a, a little bit of detail there. Talk about some proof of stake with proxying, which is how we implement uh, our protection against civil attacks, um, and some elements of uh, why, what the incentives might be for being a node or um, uh, participating in the proxy staking as a, as a wallet holder, as a, as a coin holder. And then we'll do Q&A uh, if we have time. So um, the four things that we're trying to address with uh, Hedera Hashgraph uh, are technology, which I'll talk about today uh, in more detail. Governance, I won't cover, um, but uh, we look to implement a governance uh, on top of the public network uh, that is truly world-class and, uh, and suitable for uh, a deployment of a public, public network at scale. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, scale in a second. Uh, security, um, we, um, we believe that the a public network needs to be the most secure it can possibly be. Um, and stability, again, uh, if um, anybody is going to develop uh, applications and deploy applications on the network, uh, which potentially represent um, significant value to them, uh, then the stability, not the technical stability, but the lack of forking or the lack of uh, splitting in the future for the network is critical to, uh, to, to the people who, uh, who develop on the network. So um, is the platform fast? Uh, we're talking about scalability today, I believe. Uh, one shard, uh, we can do over 100,000 transactions per second. These are micropayment transactions or I should say, cryptocurrency uh, transactions. Um, so 100,000 or more per shard. Um, we uh, get consensus within seconds in our testing. We've uh, reached consensus at these uh, transactions per second um, throughputs uh, within three to seven seconds. Um, and consensus, in our case, is 100% uh, probabilistic, probabilistic. There is no... Uh, will it stick? Will it change? Do I need to wait for a number of blocks? We're not a blockchain. Uh, we're a DLT, um, a DAG, I should say. Um, but once we reach consensus on a particular transaction, that consensus is cast in stone. It will never change. Um, and that's within a few seconds. We uh, timestamp every uh, transaction coming into the network. So we have fair timestamping, fair transaction ordering. Uh, these are determined by the algorithm and they largely depend on the, the time at which they, they enter the network. There's no prioritization going on and nodes cannot decide whether to include or not a transaction regardless of what fees you're paying. Um, everything is done with fairness. And we have fair access in that um, if you distrust a particular node, you can pick another node to send your transactions to. Um, and uh, there is no reason why a node uh, would give anyone priority uh, and suddenly you have uh, control over uh, who you send your transactions to. And it's secure. Um, it, uh, the algorithm implements uh, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance, uh, which some of you uh, probably know is the gold standard in terms of network security. Um, and this has been formally proven, uh, or rather the, uh, the maths behind the algorithm have gone through uh, independent assessment with the cock proof assistant. Uh, for those of you who are interested, all the results are available on our website. Uh, if you're into maths and into uh, formal proofs, uh, there's lots and lots of interesting stuff there. Um, 
So uh, there. So virtual voting. What do we mean by it? What does it? Uh, how does it work? Uh, and uh, why is it so good? Um, so. Uh, <laughs> For, for me, uh, virtual voting is an algorithm that calculates in a Byzantine uh, resistant manner the timestamp of transactions from two thirds of the network or more. So how do we do this? Um, or um, where, where have we come from? So voting based consensus uh, is widely accepted as being uh, the gold standard, uh, but it scales very, very poorly. Um, every uh, node has to send every other node a confirmation of message receipt and potentially voting and it's an end by end by end matrix of messages. Um, it's only ever deployed in labs, it's not practical, it will not scale. So um, what Lehman Baird, our CTO and chief scientist, uh, started working on in 2012 and uh, realized in 2015 um, was that we can achieve virtual voting. And essentially, it has all the same principles or uh, the same advantages as um, a voting-based algorithm with hardly any of its, um, of its downsides. So it's scalable, um, and it gives us a whole bunch of other properties, as I said before, fair timestamp, um, um, high availability, and so on. Um, and um, yeah, so that's what we're implementing in the Hedera uh, public network. So, gossip about gossip is kind of the foundation for how virtual voting um, works. Um, and so many protocols implement gossip. Uh, we uh, have gossip about gossip, whereby we add some information to every gossiped event, which allows the network as a whole to learn what the rest of the network knows. Uh, and this is without every node talking to each other. This is as simple as me telling somebody, I've heard this from Fred. And if that person trusts me, and we, the trust is, cryptography, uh, is through cryptography, uh, if that person trusts me, then they know I've heard it from Fred. So they know Fred knows. So if we were to then have a, an independent vote on whether three of us know this particular information, we all three of us know who knows? Therefore, we can vote. That's virtual voting. So let's say Alice wants to send a message uh, to uh, the network. She first uh, randomly picks another node. So these are all nodes on the network. In this case, she's picked Dave. Um, and then at, uh, subsequently, she'll pick another random node, and she'll, send, uh, she'll pick Gina. And Dave, uh, um, in parallel, uh, will talk to Bob. And then Alice will talk to Ellen, Bob will talk to Frank, and Gina will talk to Hank, and everybody gets to know uh, about the message. Um, now, if Bob and Carol at the same time want to tell the network something they know, they can do that. There is no assumption on synchronicity or times or time delays or anything within the network. It's entirely possible for Bob and Carol to send a message at exactly the same time to the rest of the network. And they do the same thing, they gossip um, that, that message to um, everybody else on the network. And very soon, uh, the entire network knows about, um, about the messages. Now, you will notice, if I wait for the animation to complete, um, that the colored envelopes are not necessarily in the same order for all the nodes. They've all reached the nodes at a different time and potentially in a different order. Uh, but as we'll see later on, we're still able to derive the, the order in which they've come into the network from, from an outside party um, via the, the virtual voting. <clears throat> so gossip about gossip. So we've seen how uh, everybody's kind of sent messages to each other. So how do they know or how does uh, Alice know that Bob uh, knew of something from Fred and therefore Fred knows it. Uh, we add two tiny pieces of information to every event and these are two hashes. Uh, the first one is a hash to the event below, the same vertice in the, uh, in the graph or in the, uh, from the, the node, the, sorry, from the same, uh, from the node, uh, so the column. And then the one to the, uh, the one above it is where it came from. Um, so, um, if I look at the, the second uh, round circle from the top on the left, uh, the bottom line is to A, Alice, and the uh, angled line is to B, Bob. Um, 
And we also include a timestamp in there, which is the time at which uh, that, uh, that particular event was, uh, was sent uh, by one node to another. Um, now, if we look at the dotted black line, uh, what happens in that conversation, uh, so this line would be uh, blue most likely, but uh, I've highlighted it in, in dotted black. What happens in this conversation is that um, Ellen doesn't just tell Alice, I know of this. They then have a conversation along the lines of, what do you know that I don't know, and vice versa. And they then exchange with each other all of, that, all of those missing pieces so that they can all complete their own copy of the graph in their own memory structure, if you want, um, such that whatever Ellen knows, she shared with Alice, and whatever Alice knows, she shared with Ellen. Only the delta, there's no need to resend each other the same information. Um, and if they both know about, um, sorry, if um, Ellen knows uh, or hears from Alice that she has a particular event and she, only, she already contains the, or she only has the contents of that event, she only needs to know the hash from Alice or from Ellen. She doesn't need the entire content. So we, we only pass the very minimum uh, information that's required. But what that essentially means is through the gossip and then the gossip about gossip on top of it, every single of these nodes, A, B, C, D, and F up to H, and uh, get to the point where they can build exactly the same picture of the entire conversation between all the nodes without all talking to each other. So they've achieved a view of the network that would be consistent with a pure voting mechanism, um, except that this has been done through, uh, through uh, gossip about gossip. Um, what else? Uh, yes, so that's, uh, no, I think that's it. <laughs> Now, um, so every, uh, every node, therefore, has exactly the same picture um, that all of the other nodes have. And that's what allows us to do virtual voting. Um, one thing I should say, if I go back one slide, um, when I say the graphs are identical on every single node, that's except for the very top layer, the, first, the, the last few events that have come into the network that haven't quite been gossiped to everyone yet, they're still in a kind of unknown state as to uh, who knows about them, but this will get resolved as new events get put in. And if no events get put into the network, the nodes themselves will generate events in order to ensure that they gossip about stuff. So um, even if there are no transactions coming in, the nodes will gossip to each other in order to keep building that graph so that uh, it doesn't just stop because there is no activity coming into the network. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, but those, that, top level uh, or that those last few events from the last few seconds are not really that relevant at that, at that time. At the point we're doing virtual voting, we really care about what we all know uh, down below. So um, every node gets this information, every node uh, runs the same algorithm, they all come to exactly the same conclusion, completely independent of each other. So even if you take nodes out of the network, they will continue to come to um, to, to consensus independently, not necessarily exactly at the same time, but they will all, uh, they will all get there within, you know, within a second or half a second or even less than that. Um, and uh, what's important to point out here is there is no leader election. No, there is no leader. Every single one of these nodes are making exactly the same decision at roughly the same time. Um, so that's um, one of the properties in terms of DDoS protection. There is no leader to take out. So how do, we virtual, how do we virtually vote? Well, we start by, um, so we define a round created. Um, so uh, it's hard to define everything without referring to other things. Um, but uh, we define um, a round, uh, or a round is created when a super majority of witnesses from the previous, one, previous round can be strongly seen. And, and we'll ex I'll explain those, uh, those things later on. Um, and a witness is defined as the first event in a round for a given node. Um, so why do we define witnesses? Well, it turns out that it makes the calculations, we, we can limit our calculations in terms of the algorithm to just those witnesses, witness events um, in order to reduce the calculation requirements to the absolute minimum. And we, we still retain all of the security and, and so on capabilities of the algorithm. Uh, but we don't need to do all the calculations on every single event, just the witnesses. And that's, that's enough for, uh, for what we're looking to do. 
Um, so um, it's also possible for a round. I don't think I have one in this example. Yeah, round four. Uh, there are no witnesses in for Alice and uh, Carol. That's perfectly okay. Uh, as far as the algorithm is concerned, uh, we, can, uh, we can deal with that. So, uh, what's a famous witness? Um, so, a famous witness means that lots of people see it in the round uh, that follows. Um, so, if we look at B2, uh, and that will be done for every single wit witness uh, by the algorithm eventually, but just looking at B2 for now, if it's seen by lots of people in round three, is defined as being famous. So, um, if, can we, uh, so if we look at the witnesses in round three um, and we, we determine they can see B2, um, we do that by following the lines. So we, we follow the lines from um, A3 and we look to see if A3 can see B2. B3 is the same, C3, uh, C3, C3, uh, can C3 see it? Uh, through D3, through B3, B2, yes. So. All of the round three witnesses can see um, B2, which means that uh, B2 is defined as a famous witness. Um, and that's what the algorithm does. Um, so we will do this for every single uh, witness event. We'll do this for every single round. And if in a given round we don't uh, identify a famous witness, we'll just carry on until such a time as that um, event can be defined as being famous. So, um, now that we've defined famous witnesses, we need to count votes, where we need to get to the point where we virtually vote on whether uh, we, can, uh, we can determine uh, if, if those events should be taken into account or not. Uh, so we do this in round four. So we're two rounds ahead of the events that we're uh, considering right now. Um, and what we define by strongly seen is to strongly, sorry, is to see them through a supermajority. And in our case, supermajority is two thirds of the, of the, the, the population. Um, I, um, I'm gonna touch on stake. Uh, it's not the number of nodes that matter this, uh, when we do this calculation in our public deployment. It's the stake that's held by each individual node. So the supermajority in this case is not machines, but the stake that they hold. And I'll, I'll cover uh, proxy staking uh, in a second. Um, so uh, if B4 was to count uh, the votes, uh, can it strongly see A3? Well, yes, because it has multiple paths from B4 to A3, um, and it has passed through two, uh, three out of four nodes, and, and it can count itself as, as one. Uh, so that's a supermajority, so it strongly sees, so B4 uh, strongly sees A4. Uh, now if we move on to, um, uh, sorry, uh, B4 and B3, again, we have a, a path through the majority or supermajority of nodes, and it would therefore vote yes. Likewise for C3 and likewise for D3. So that means that um, having looked through, uh, so every, again, every single node does this completely independently. So we've got four copies of this stuff going on at the same time, and they've all voted virtually that yes, they can see um, A2, I think it was, uh, was it A2? Yes. Um, so, uh, sorry, B2. So B2 um, is uh, famous. It's strongly seen by supermajority. Having done this now for a number of rounds, um, we've determined which events are famous and which ones aren't. So the, the green events are famous. Uh, the blue event, C2, isn't famous yet. Uh, and again, it may take a couple more rounds or another round or two. Uh, before we determine whether C2 is famous or not. Um, and that's okay. We'll just, we'll, we'll just wait on the requisite number of rounds. Well, wait. We'll run through the requisite number of rounds to, uh, to define if, uh, if C2 is or, or not. Um, right, so we now have consensus. Um, every, every node has gone through its calculations, has virtually voted on, uh, on the sort of the famousness of, of the events. Um, and has done so independently. So how do we um, now manage transaction ordering? 
Um, so we look at the round in which, um, so we define the round receive as the, the round in which an event uh, was first um, defined as famous. Um, so um, A2, B2, and D2 can see this black event. So this, this has a, a, a round uh, received of two. Uh, we then look at all the events that have a round received of two. Um, we look at, uh, so, um, we, uh, we look at the, sorry, no, we don't. <laughs> We look at the timestamp um, that, uh, that this event has um, and perform a median calculation of the timestamp from uh, all of the nodes for that particular event. Uh, median meaning that if we have some significant outliers, if one particular node has introduced an event claiming it was from last year, then it, it will be discounted from the calculation being a median. An average would obviously pull it, pull it down towards that uh, that outlier. So a median means that we can uh, we can uh, sorry we can eliminate outliers, um, and the uh, the medium uh, timestamp of those three events that can see the black one uh, essentially allows us to determine um, the the time relative to other events at which uh, the the black event uh, arrived. Uh, in the network and we can therefore put those events in consensus order and the nodes will then execute each of the transactions in that same consensus order which prevents us from double spending. If you've spent all of your coin in one transaction that's followed by another transaction that's trying to spend more of your coin that you've already spent then that transaction will fail. Um, the, the event will be received and be given a timestamp but the transaction of um, removing to, uh, coins from your account and putting coins into somebody else's account will fail because your balance is at zero. Um, so um, through um, gossip about gossip and virtual voting, uh, we've, uh, we've identified uh, transaction ordering uh, and all, all through um, uh, uh, an asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant uh, manner. So. Proof of stake with proxying. Uh, so we're talking about incentives and Sybil attack resistance here. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the virtual voting is about uh, calculating the timestamp of transactions and so on. But what's the network? So what's the network? It's not nodes. We don't care about the number of nodes in the network. Uh, what we care about is their stake. Um, so a node uh, will have an account um, attached to it and that account will contain coin. Um, it um, will also, the, um, anybody who's uh, a user of the network will potentially have a wallet that will contain coin. Um, and they can either hoard that money and keep it for themselves, or those coins, I should say, um, or they can proxy stake those coins to a node. They can actually proxy stake it to an account um, of their choosing, and that account can then proxy proxy stake uh, onto a node. And what that means is the node uh, essentially gains additional stake from all of those proxies, um, and its voting power, when we're counting votes, increases as a result. Uh, so, if every, in the voting earlier we, we did four votes, um, if every node has one stake, then that's, uh, we need three out of four in order to get our two thirds. Uh, but if one of them had uh, a slightly higher stake, then maybe the calculation is two out of four instead of three out of four. Um, as long as the stake is greater than two thirds when we count the votes, uh, then we're good to go. Um, and this prevents uh, Sybil attacks whereby if you create a thousand nodes, you divide your stake by a thousand and you gain no further votes. You're voting a thousand times, a thousand, well, a thousand times more often, but with a thousand times less uh, voting power. Um, what's also important here is there is no depositing, there's no locking, there's no slashing. We don't uh, penalize anyone. Uh, in fact, if you proxy your tokens or your coins to a node, you're free to carry on spending those coins while the node is proxying them or while they're proxied to the, the, uh, the node. Um, so it's more like a, an interesting bearing account, an interest bearing account. And as you can see, um, as an owner of coin, you get payments back. Um, our transactions will have fees um, and those fees are paid back to nodes in order for nodes to, uh, to kind of realize um, 
not necessarily a profit, but at least be compensated for, uh, for operating a node. And if you've proxied some of your coin to a node, you will receive some of those payments back uh, as, as a proportion of the node's own. Um, uh, so that might be an incentive for you to, or for somebody uh, to, uh, to proxy their coin to, um, to the nodes. Um, and that's it for proxying. So in conclusion, uh, Hashgraph as an algorithm implemented by Hedera as a public network uh, achieves the gold standard of security uh, with asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance. It's incredibly fast, it's bandwidth efficient, it's leaderless, and uh, yeah, it's uh, going uh, open access, which means it will be available for everyone uh, Q1 next year. 2019, and we have test nets up and running right now. Um, if you want more information, uh, Hedera.com has a white paper. Um, there are uh, the cock proofs that I mentioned, the, the formal proofs on the algorithm. Uh, there's a Discord channel for developers, Telegram channel for the non-developers, um, hashgraph.org for education, gohedera.com, you can um, register on our portal to earn some uh, mainnet coins, uh, either through testing activities or development activities, um, SDKs and so on for the developers out there on GitHub, um, and plenty of videos online. So thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thanks, Greg. I really enjoyed that. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, excellent. We can start there, perhaps. Yeah, just uh, two quick, maybe related questions. One is this, I didn't really get, is this permissioned or permissionless system? And on the other hand, do I get it correctly that besides the actual data and the state of data, you need, or every node needs to keep a state of every other node, like uh, their view on what state every other node in the network has, and does that scale horizontally, basically? Right, so uh, permission, permissionless. Um, so at launch, we're calling it a permissioned, permissionless network. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't do anything like everybody else, so we, we have to come up with something different. Um, Permissionless in that if you want to develop an application on the network, you can do so without telling us. So there is no, so it's a public network, anyone can use it. Permissions in that to start with, we will have 39 uh, nodes that will run the network um, until such a time as we're comfortable that the token distribution is widespread enough that we can open it to the rest of the world. Um, our uh, concern, and, and this is, um, so Hedera is very conservative uh, in that the, the public we're trying to address, uh, we're, we're, we're wanting this to be trillion dollars worth of value transacting through the system, uh, the, the layer on top of the internet if you want moving forwards. Um, so we are being uh, cautious, we're being um, uh, careful with regards to security and stability of the network. And if we opened it to the rest of the world overnight before we know what our token value is, um, there's every possibility somebody could take it over. Um, so we are uh, deploying it slowly and slowly until such a time as uh, a civil attack is impossible uh, because the coins are all over the place rather than somebody buying enough coins to, to bring the network down, uh, which is potentially possible at, at the very outset or the very early days. Um, so that's the uh, permission permissionless uh, <laughs> uh, aspect. Um, your other question was, sorry, in terms of nodes knowing everything. So um, we, um, we don't anticipate, even, even when the network has tens of thousands of nodes, these will be um, separated into shards uh, for various reasons. Uh, one is the uh, nodes will have differing performance characteristics uh, and it's it's unreasonable to expect a Raspberry Pi to compete with uh, a large system in a data center that has uh, you know, GPUs and so on and so forth. But we want to ena enable Raspberry Pis to participate as well. Um, so there may be part of a low throughput, low transaction rate, uh, lower transaction cost um, network or shard in, in, the, in, the, bigger, in the bigger picture. Um, so inherently, yes, if we have 10,000s of nodes, 
Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I think one of the, the properties of an ABFT protocol are such that there is so much message exchange going on, it would get slower and slower and slower. But by sharding, we can petition, we can petition this um, and manage the throughput and the performance of the network by keeping the, uh, the messaging overhead, if you want, of the consensus uh, to a mani manageable uh, number without losing any of the ABFT capabilities of the, of the network. Right, I think there was another question over here. Did you want to ask a question? Well, uh, I think in some way you answered that with the sharding. My question was more how do you uh, imagine the network topology to look like? Because a lot of your examples looked like it was a fully connected graph, and that obviously does not scale well in a peer to peer setting. Um, so, um, so, sharding will take geography into account for, uh, for stability reasons, if anything else. Um, the minute you, so we talk a lot about, um, and one of the questions I'm often asked is, we're centralized uh, because we have a council of 39 companies. Um, they only have two and a half percent voting power. So in terms of centralization, that's pretty decentralized to me. Uh, but centralization at a technical level is also where are the nodes located? Um, so part of our sharding strategy will also to be looking at how we um, distribute or how what the distribution is of nodes geographically uh, in order to avoid uh, a, any potential geographical um, concentration. Um, at the same time, there may be regulations that require shards to be in one particular geography in order to do some particular activities that can't go outside the bounds of a particular geography. Uh, that's entirely possible as well. Uh, so we're looking at lots of different uh, topologies um, to, to address not just the technology, uh, the performance, but also the, the usage, the, the use cases of, of such a network. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. No, one more question. All right, a quick one then. So just, just before you ask, while I'm here and I can, I'm here for the last two days. You can't really miss me, so come find me if you want to. <laughs> I want, we'll do one but more quick question on, yeah. and then we'll move on. Um, I would just like to ask if um, I join the system and I get some stake, can I then choose to run a node? So not for the first few years, no. Uh, but then, but, in, yes. But eventually, uh, so we say two to five years. It will depend on, on adoption and... and uh, and deployment speed, uh, but two to five years from now, you could you could very well run a node yourself, yes. And running a node, you would be earning uh, transaction fees. Um, yeah.